Hello, everyone, and welcome to Hyperthesis Podcast, episode number 34. I'm Patrick. I'm Feely. I'm Liam. Oh, and I'm Catherine. <laughs> Yeehaw. Well, as you heard from our intro, we have a very special guest on the show today. We have Catherine Bravoire, who will be joining us to talk about her research uh, to do with atomic force microscopy uh, and some other interesting topics. Uh, So just as a quick introduction uh, before we get there, uh, Catherine is a master's student in experimental condensed matter physics at McGill University in Montreal. And she is currently a part of the Gruder Group. Uh, and they scan, uh, or they use scanning probe microscopy to specify... Jeez. Uh, that's, a, that's a lot of words that she can probably explain a lot better. Um, but she's specifically looking uh, or working with low temperature atomic force microscope system, uh, where she looks at single electron charging events. Uh, Catherine completed her honors BSc from St. Francis Xavier University in Antigonish, where we also did our degrees. So that's how we know Catherine. Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm so happy to be here. Um, Yeah, honestly, it's an honor to be on your podcast. It's so cool what you guys have been doing. Uh, In all seriousness, though, like I was actually talking about it today to a couple of people in my group, and they think it's uh, pretty awesome um, that there's some people who... uh, um, out there doing these podcasts, just like, you know, present all these like physics topics to people who are in physics or, in, or who are not in physics and just generally are interested in these topics. So, yeah. Yeah. One, one interesting thing is that there's a lot of, I mean, there's a ton of science podcasts, but a lot of them kind of focus on established scientists. And because we are not fully established scientists, we tend to hit up our friends who want to be guests. <laughs> who are in the middle of their degrees or research and whatnot. Yeah, and uh, it, it's certainly a good platform for up-and-coming scientists, and we'll tell you how to contact us a lot later. But before we start, and before we get into Catherine's work, we, of course, have our intro topics. But even before then, we have a quick correction from Liam. Yes, um, in the last episode, I kept saying the energy um, of the vacuum was zero. That, that's not the case. Um, that's actually a highly kind of, I don't want to say debate it, but it's a current unknown in, in physics, what the energy density of the vacuum is. It's known as the cosmological constant problem or the vacuum catastrophe problem. Um, I won't go into that because it's not related to today's episode, but. I mean, I touched on that when you mentioned vacuum, that's like, this is a ground is ground state. It doesn't mean the zero, right? Like, well, what yeah. we don't know about that is, is, is what we don't know, I guess. Well, mo- yeah, moving there's on. This, there's, yeah. there's this big problem where mathematically, when you try and calculate the energy density, you get something that blows up to infinity. Um, but I, I won't get into that. Essentially, you have that cosmological constant issue where we, we don't know what it... We, we, I guess we've measured it, but the two theories we have don't agree on it. So We'll uh, certainly have to do more on the cosmological constant, maybe in another episode. But uh, to start, uh, do we have intertopics? Yes, yes, yes. Now, this one is interesting. It, it came from my dream last night. God. And, okay, this is an absurd dream. So I was dreaming, it was in my, I think my grandparents' house, like the one they had like years ago. And there was like a, a, a bowl, like a pet bowl for food. And then cats start coming. Not you, cat, like cat. Like, and it's not just, like, it's not just random cats. They are like all, they're all rusties. Like Liam's cats, they're like oh, the my, orange my, cats. Yeah, the like they're all cat. the same, rusty. Like that's the name of Liam's cat, and all coming like try to get that that one bowl of food. It's a little bit terrifying, but there's like a, a like undulating wave of like hundreds of cats in the hallway. So, but how does that relate to to the main topic? Uh so not main topic, the the intro topic. So I st- I woke up, not in sweat. I was like, yeah, that's is weirdly pleasant dream. It's like, but I'll start thinking like, well, there's this thing, you know, when things, when it looks like there's like traffic, right? Like hundreds of cats try to get to a place. And well, why are there waves? 
it looks like wave. And so I remember there's something called tr- like ghost wave in traffic that create like this kind of traffic jam that out of nowhere, you know. So, so what's interesting that in is that in fluid mechanics there are mechanism to try to describe that too. But if you think about it, have you ever been driving on a highway and you'd be like, well, people start to start stopping. There's traffic jam that there's like, there's no accident, there's nothing, you know, everything is smooth. But because there are a lot of cars, they just like, there's always like, you have to brake and stop for a few seconds and then go. So I think those are ghost traffic jam just, just, it's just happened because there are fluctuations in person's speed. And once you start like slowing down a certain part, it, it propagates onto the like the following part of the traffic yeah i think like all right first off when you said i was gonna like the intro topic today i was not expecting that uh interesting but yeah i think what happens a lot of the time is like like i think of driving past toronto like one car will break suddenly because they were about to miss their exit or something something dumb and then the car behind them breaks, and the car behind them breaks. And next thing you know, if you looked at it above from a helicopter, you get this wave of like breaking that seemingly out of nowhere. It's like it's like a cascade effect or something. It's uh, really interesting to see this. I, I remember reading about this and then watching a, a related video about this many years ago. But uh, there are studies on how those waves propagate through. So they're somewhere... Uh, it stops, it grows slightly, and then shrinks a lot. But you also have some of the longest traffic jams in the world being caused just by someone lightly breaking, and then the person behind breaking even more and more until you have massive traffic jams. And in places like Los Angeles, which is infamous for terrible traffic, uh, I believe Montreal is also pretty infamous for terrible traffic, and maybe drivers too. But um, oh no, uh, there's uh, it, it, it. This is how a lot of these major traffic jams are caused. Is just some light breaking and also not leaving room for the person in front of you um i mean yeah honestly uh you are on point with the fact that there's a lot of uh, traffic in montreal especially as someone uh, my family has a, a country home like about an hour and a half away um and so i try to get there every weekend and leaving on the friday after work around 5 p.m is the classic traffic jam but uh, yeah no it's uh it's crazy. And it's something that you take for granted as well. And like, it's interesting that Feely brought this up in his cat dream metaphor, if you will. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like, I mean, you're there and you just like accept it, but it is a crazy concept that it is like, you're just there and you're like, Oh, why is this taking two hours and a half instead of one hour and a half? And it's just the concept of one car slightly breaking. And then afterwards breaking more, breaking more, breaking more. And it's just like this wave effect. Um, and people don't really think about it that way, but yeah, I mean, yeah, that's super interesting. Well, there's, in a city, that's why people would start to impose um, public transport, like trains, sky trains, subways, because they, they don't abide by these, like, you know, it's, I think it's a problem of dimensionality if you talk more mathematically, right? And like Liam would know more because like the chaotic systems create, one way to create chaotic, chaotic system is to add dimensions. What do you mean by that? We add more, more and more particles. The system tend to be more chaotic because it's harder to guess where it's going to go, right? So a small, any small disturbance is going to create something that you might not expect or you know, change the way we look at it. Yeah, uh, I guess more like re- uh, not, not thinking of it mathematically. I think it just comes down to that pe- like all the world's problems, people cause them. Um, it's a people have reaction times, right? Like if you're at a, a stoplight and it turns green, on paper everyone should start moving at once and more people would get through. But realistically, it's like the first car sits there for a second and they're like, oh, the light's green and they go and the person behind them moves a little bit. And by the time the person five cars back starts moving, it's turned red. It's like, okay. Have you ever noticed, um, I don't know, in the <laughs> men haircut world but whenever like you have like a, an appointment like at 3 p.m or something to go get your haircut or like a dentist appointment or something like that and you arrive at 3 p.m but actually they take you in at like 3 30 because of the cascade of all lateness throughout the days of all the appointments and it just like and then you're just like stuck at the end of the day where it's like finally delayed 30 minutes when like the first delay was like two minutes and that, that just like totally just you know messes up all all the rest of the day if you will 
just like having meetings with your supervisor or like meetings in the department it's like if your meeting's later in the day everyone's behind by an hour because physicists suck at staying on time at least where i am well i think the barber thing is kind of strange because i came here first i was like why do i have to book appointments for barbers it was never a thing you just walk in and get your hair cut you have to wait for a little bit but this is such a norm it's like people here take appointments for everything it was just to me it's weird They're like you know let's just walk in it's like it's a shop to provide services you just walk in to get it now you have to like call make appointment to like this is a little bit too much. <laughs> so I don't want to go like too much on a tangent, um, but speaking about appointments, I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but like me living like in a big city, but I think about appointments, I think about how like now you need to like, you know, get appointments, but now you need to get re- reservations to go to restaurants. I don't know if you've noticed this t- since COVID, but um, now any restaurant that you want to go to, you need to book a reservation because everything's completely booked up. Whereas before COVID, like you could just walk in, like Philly was just saying, like walk in, grab a table, whatever, wherever you're going could be like a simple restaurant, fancy restaurant, whatever it is. But now it's just like, it's something that's blown my mind because it's like in the past, like six months that this has been happening. And of course, Montreal, you're a little bit more in that, like eating out culture, um, you know, going to little restaurants. Cause like, I think we have like the most restaurants per capita in like the whole entire country or something like that. Um, but it's actually crazy. Cause like something that was an experience where you casually go after work or something like that to go grab a bite to eat with friends, you need to like book in advance a reservation or at least check that there's, uh, there's availabilities, um, which is, I don't know, something that I've just noticed on, on the whole, uh, booking, um, topic. No, a hundred percent. I went to the campus pub today at lunch, like not even like this nice restaurant, like it, it's okay, but you know, it's a typical like pub. And I went there with a, this incoming grad student who might go to McMaster. Um, and then a couple other grad students and we we're telling him about the physics department here. But anyway, I showed up and the place is half empty and they're like, you have a reservation? I was like, what do you mean? Like, look at all these tables. And they're like, oh, they're all reserved. And luckily, I did have a reservation. Um, the department made one for me without me realizing it. So that was great. But I was like, what do you mean? It's like lunchtime on a Monday at the campus pub. Like, the overpriced campus pub. Surely you're not booked. But I guess they were. I don't know. That's That was uh, that was really strange. So I, I, I see your point. I, I will just say, I, uh, I just looked it up. And Victoria actually has the highest number of restaurants per capita. They have so few capita. Well, that's true. You know what? I think uh, I think you're right. What I think is the stat that is true in Montreal. I think it's the most opened and then closed restaurants per capita because that's a huge thing in Montreal. Where like restaurants, I think there's like I think it's like the most restaurants that open per day and then they close within like two weeks or something like it's ridiculous. But yeah, I thought Kingston has pretty high too. It was one of the top, I think. So steering this back to uh, back to the uh, this this effect of waves propagating and traffic and in other places like a dentist's office or a doctor's office uh any final comments on that topic i mean my uh my question is to to feely the cats in your dream just to go back to the original uh metaphor were, were they in a traffic jam or was it like people were slowing down while they were coming towards the food and then it stopped and then there was a wave or is it just like they just had a wave tendency coming towards you in the food um i i want to give my guess i like to envision it was like waves crashing against like a boat in like a movie or a dock but they were just like ginger cats and they all meowed every time the wave hit. it was like meow, meow. <laughs> that's what i that's what i'm envisioning well, I don't. I I didn't hear. I don't recall any sounds. But it's like there's only one food bowl. It's like a triangle that's like part out of it, and somehow the cat moved like vertically up and down. It's not like it's not like traffic wave, which is like <laughs> it's it's weird. It's like a a water wave, which doesn't make any sense because it's a dream, right? It's like well, it's like a, you know like the the cat meme thing. Is it, it's like curved up. Yeah, the cats like do an inverted U shape and they just go up and down. Honestly, you guys should all start a spinoff podcast on uh, Feely's dreams. I think uh... that's pretty much what this podcast is anyway. We just don't <laughs> tell people, but now they know. <laughs> I used to keep a dream journal, you know, but not anymore. <laughs> that's too bad.
Anyway, moving on uh, from talking about Feely's dreams, and uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll hear more about that in future episodes, and who knows, it could be the next relativity. Um, but, but for now, uh, let's transition over to our main topic, which is all about Catherine and her research. So what do you do? <laughs> um, I find it funny when people ask me that because it's, uh, it's always hard to, and I mean, I guess you guys all understand, it's always hard to try to explain that. But essentially what Patrick was saying, um, I am an experimental condensed matter physicist. Um, so I work in a lab pretty much all day, every day. Um, and specifically the group, uh, that I work in is a scanning probe microscopy group. And so we have scanning probe microscopes, which is literally in its definition, its title, it's a probe used to scan different surfaces and you can get different information out of it. Um, but specifically, um, the scanning probe microscopy technique that uh, is our specialty is atomic force microscopy, um, which essentially is a probe that comes close to a surface. And um, depending on the forces that it feels, and you know, we're more interested in long range forces, so Van der Waals forces, um, uh, we feel those forces close to the surface and we're able to detect um, topography and other cool things at the surface. Uh, specifically, so in our group, we have like nine different AFMs, right? AFM is atomic force microscopes. We have like nine different AFMs. They all do different things, um, which is pretty cool because that means you can touch in so many different domains. You can do some electrochemistry if you're doing AFM in liquid. Uh, you can do um, uh, uh, like ultra high vacuum um, AFM as well uh, to look at like 2D materials. Um, there's also this one bio AFM that we had at one point where someone in our group, uh, who had a biophysics background, uh, was trying to reconnect neurons actually, um, just like for fun and trying to see like how that goes with AFM because AFM, you can use it as a probe and like connect things with it. You can drag it on the surface, but we normally don't drag it on the surface. Um, and then, um, what I do which is something that I'm I'm the most familiar with. So my AFM is a home-built AFM built about 20 years ago um, in our group. So naturally home-built instruments uh, for anybody who's listening or who has any, um, you know, uh, experience in this. It's a lot of troubleshooting. It's a lot of work. You constantly improve it. Um, but yeah, so my home-built AFM is a low-temperature AFM. So we go down to four Kelvin and um, we basically with at this temperature, we're able to um, look at uh, single electron charging events and materials. So there's someone in my group who looks at quantum dots. Um, I'm looking more at molecules and enzymes and looking how electrons are tunneling in and out of your sample, basically with our low temperature AFM. So I guess that was a very big nutshell, but that is my research in a nutshell. Well, what's the scale of your research in terms of the, the order of magnitude, right? Are you, are you looking at each individual atoms, like in terms of, like, is it like angstroms? Are they like you know, nanometers or like what, what kind of scaling are we talking about in terms of, because in the, in, in the word microscope to explain a bit for, for maybe the younger folks, if you remember labs in like high school, middle school, you look into this little like uh, equipment with a lens to see the structure of the cells, right? Can just basically take a step further to look deeper and deeper into maybe the structure of molecules. Um, not not even. I'm not really sure, right? That's why I'm asking about the scale. Yeah, so that's a good question, and maybe I maybe I should rephrase a little bit more my research in that way. Like you're right. Like you know, you you have the concept of a microscope in a lab in high school, uh, and you look at it. You look at different samples. You look at different. You can look at. You can see cells. Um, but the thing is that you can't resolve like at like atomic level, if you will, optically, you can't do that. So that's why the probe comes in. It's something that can detect, um, you know, there's all sorts of SPMs, but ours in our case is like, just like a, this oscillating probe that detects forces. And that's, that's how you image topography. That's how you would like image like an atom or something like that. So to answer your question, Feely, like it depends on the AFM. So you have AFMs that their goal is to get the highest resolution image of atoms. And you can, there is like 
publications out there, groups that that's what they do. They try to use AFM to image the smallest with the highest resolution. Now, what I do in my spe- with my specific AFM, I don't really care about resolution. I care more about molecule size. So sometimes it's in the order of two nanometers um, to 10 nanometers, depending on what I'm looking at. Uh, my scan range would be about like five, uh, it could be like five to, sorry, maybe like 10, depends what I, which instrument I'm using on. So like five micrometers, sometimes if I want something larger, uh, maybe a thousand nanometers or 500 nanometers, if I want something smaller, um, sometimes I think the smallest we've gone is 50 nanometers in scan range, but to look at things that are more 10 nanometers or two nanometers in size, depending on what molecule you're looking at. So we're just, because we're looking at properties, we're less about the resolution of like looking at how, like if I'm looking at an enzyme, I'm not really interested in seeing all the little folding of the protein and everything like that. I'm just looking at how can I use my AFM to probe these like tunneling events. So just to tack on to that, how small is the probe you're using or the tip of the probe? Like how, how, how small is it and how fast is it actually uh, sampling the surface? So, oh my gosh, you're asking me something that I should know. I forget exactly how small the probe is. You know, it's like one of those information that like you're supposed to know on the spot, but you completely forget. Um, but um, actually, like, why don't we just look it up right now? That was, that was me during my comprehensive exam ask me all these things i'm supposed to know and it's like oh god but like you know what like i'm not even ashamed of that like there's so much (laughs) when you go into grad schools there's so much that you need to know and that like you just like kind of you know all those like little details that you're supposed to know on the fly it's just like it just kind of like passes you you knew it at one point and then it just like comes out of your like brain the next point or whatever it is um but like tip probes i they're i mean they're in the they're in the micrometer range right um yeah, so they're like about like 10 micrometers or so. Um, but it oscillates. So our cantilevers oscillate at about 150 um, kilohertz, I'd say. That's like its resonance frequency. But um, but yeah, that's uh, that's how uh, how fast they those little things oscillate. That's, okay, so that is interesting because you know the, it's the the concept of atomic force microscopy is probably unfamiliar to like most people right because this technology is it new or is it something that um, I've been around for a long time people haven't used it because when you think about the picture of an atom of molecules like n- nobody ever tells us like in high school oh this come from AFM right so is it a new technology we you guys are researching or is it have been around for a while but hasn't like the technology hasn't caught up um, so, okay, so AFM is not a new technology. It was, I think, invented in the 80s. Um, I believe yes. it didn't get a Nobel Prize, I don't think. I think it was just like a, yeah. That's my, um, the, the end story for today is the eight, 1986 Nobel Prize, which it wasn't, it was for, it was for the electron microscope. Half of it was for the electron microscope, and half of it was for a scanning tunneling microscope. So I don't quite. It was kind of. It was partially for AMF, I think, a little bit, but it was so new at the time. Well, well, the thing is, like the concept of time for us is our period is kind of strange. You said it's it's not new; it's in the eighties. But to me, wow, that's very new. Because to me, like, oh, I'm talking like eighteen hundred. Like, <laughs> so it's like, wow, this is quite a new technology because you got to understand, right? That's like, it takes decades until a technology would be more like practical from a theoretical viewpoint. And to be able to do that in a few years, to me, that's, that's, that is very quick. Imagine how, how hard it would be to make the first microscope, right? Thousands of years, we didn't have this. So we had no idea what bacteria, that bacteria exists, right? So... So we, we have guesses for a long time. It takes hundreds of years people to come up with optics and stuff. And now it's like, oh, it's 80s. It's old. Like, oh my God. Like, we have come so far as a human species, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, it's funny that you say that. And you're, you're entirely right. And like, that's what like, I, when I first heard about AFM, so when I, when you, you, you guys were already graduated from St. Effects and I've <laughs> gone into the real world. And I remember um, when I was looking into it, I got approached by this uh, professor, so by Peter Gruder. 
Um, and I started, you know, doing some digging on AFM and I was like, oh my gosh, like, this is such a cool instrument. And I remember um, talking to uh, Peter Poole about it or no, I'm sorry. I've talked to Peter Marslin about it. And he was like, too many Peter, too many Peters, too many Peters in my life. Um, I talked to Peter Marslin about it and he was, he was like, oh, that's an old instrument. <laughs> and then ever since he said that, I was like, oh my gosh, like this is an old instrument. And like, oh, this is like eighties, like all the original papers are from the eighties. Like, what is this? So, um, that's pretty much why I call it like an old instrument, I guess. But, um, I mean, like there's so many cool things. It's just like it's a type of instrument that you can always like improve and it's so versatile like i said you can do like such novel um stuff with it and um always improve the technique and like use those techniques in like so many different things so i i'm curious about um this technique versus something like using uh scanning electron micro microscopy or tunneling electron mic microscopy why use this instead of those um so the scanning tunneling mic microscope, right? You're, you're kind of inducing this like current, if you will. Right. And that's how you, you detect things on the, on the surface. Um, but with this AFM, so <laughs> how can I describe this? Like your, your AFM can resolve a lot more, if you will, on this. Uh, and, and you can actually do a lot of different, you can look at a lot of different things. Um, so you can, you know, look at your frequency shift in your cantilever. You can look at your amplitude change. You can look, um, at, you know, your Z change of your, because there's this whole feedback circuit. So like how your, your, um, your cantilever can adjust its height with this feedback circuit, depending on like, what, like the forces it feels. Um, so you can do, it's a little bit more of a versatile technology in my opinion. Um, and, uh. And yeah, it's just like, uh, especially with what I'm doing. So with me looking at these charging events in molecules and in dots and quantum dots, um, we use the frequency shift of our cantilever um, to basically access these, these tunneling events in our molecule. So that's something that an SDM can't do, um, uh, doing these single electron um, transfers. Maybe it's kind of like a naive picture, but I always picture these things as my head. It's just like a record, like a record playing the tip of a record player going up and down on a record, except instead of, you know, instead of music coming out, it's data, something similar like that. Yeah. So, I mean, I remember speaking to Carl about this, um, our professor Carl, and I kind of liked his description of AFM, which was like, it's kind of like a blind man's microscope where like, if you have like a little walking stick and you're just like oscillating it while you're walking in the room and then you're just like oh like oh, i'm feeling this table here and then oh, i'm gonna go back down because i don't feel this table anymore and you're just like constantly adjusting like with your like your uh with your resonance frequency so it's kind of like that that if you will well my my take on it is that electron microscopy has a, a flaw right like you have to shoot electrons into it to have something bounce back and detect it. Well, how's that going to work when you try to detect electron electronic um, behavior, right? You can't just disturb it. Like, so um, AFM makes makes more sense in terms of trying to find things with interactions. And, you know, it's, it's, to me, it's more passive than just, you know, Im imagine like invasive surgery, right? You're just shooting electrons into the system and now you, you're, you're more, more gentle with, with it. It is, yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, like you brought up something that I forgot to mention. It's that it's it's being um, it's it's less invasive for sure uh, than your than STM or SEM, um, which makes it yeah. You can look at things that are you, you know you, you, that that's where the versatile versa. I don't know how to say this. I'm a French person. Versatile, um, <laughs> but it, that's why it makes it more versatile because you can look at all sorts of different things. Um, and you can actually, uh, resolve, uh, have like atomic, uh, resolution of things. So, um, that's mainly the reason why AFM, uh, came along. Uh, so apart from the, the, the methodology of AFM, like, so can you t tell me about your interest in what you're looking at, right? Like what may, you know, maybe you're interested in AFM, but, but what's your interest in what you're looking at? Are you interested in like, oh, these molecules are so cool or like these, these interactions are. Are like fascinating. It's like what got you to look into like using the methodology you have onto, you know, the sample. Yeah. So I mean, one of the things that really interested me in 
this group, but also particularly in the instrument that I'm using is the fact that it's not just topography, right? That I, I told you, like, I'm, I'm not interested necessarily in resolution and all these beautiful pictures of quantum dots or molecules or enzymes or whatever. Um, we're actually looking at quantum properties of these dots or these molecules or these enzymes. And I thought that was pretty cool because, I mean, I like when a certain field touches different things, right? I'm in condensed matter physics, but I'm looking at quantum properties of certain materials. And I'm also looking at quantum properties of enzymes. So that touches also biology. And I'm also looking at the electrochemistry of these molecules or these enzymes. So I'm touching like so many different things and fields, which I thought was really interesting. And specifically with this instrument, what I thought was really cool um, is going at this low temperature, we can actually look at these single electron charging events. And that what you basically see, um, and I'm not going to go into all the detail because I don't want to like <laughs> go like super into it, um, but you see like these rings that occur around your molecule or your dot. And that's basically your cantilever that's accessing the different energy levels of where your electron can tunnel between the electrode and the molecule that you're looking at or the quantum dot that you're looking at. And that's what I thought was cool. It was like, wow, okay, so we can use something that like originally was made to look at very small scales of materials or atoms or whatever it is. And we use that instrument to actually quantify these quantum properties of different stuff that could be useful. The quantum dots, I mean, classic study, it's, it's you know, studied to potentially be used in quantum computing. Um, and the molecules and the enzymes specifically that I'm looking at, the reason why I'm looking at these quantum properties and using my instrument is to hopefully use enzymes as a biomimetic analog. So that basically means using a biological process and technology. So using their process um, in sustainable energy development. So it's like, hey, I'm looking at properties of this enzyme using AFM to possibly understand this even more and actually harness its um, its potential in, in sustainable energy um, uh, production. Oh, what a great answer. Which leads me to the next question, really. Because I remember in undergrad, you were more of a theorist, and now you switched gear completely. So... Can you tell me about that journey? What what made the change? I know you talked about you know looking up um you, know, you got approached by this and you start researching on it. But to me, like at least personally, to me, I can't see myself working in a lab. You know, like I knew myself like, well, I I probably can do it. I mean, I actually like the lab. Some of the labs that we did at in undergrad, I did it pretty well. I mean, uh, you know, I did all the labs pretty well, but. But I know that I'm not gonna be a, be a experimentalist. Like I know that uh, I'm TAing the lab right now, and I'm having some fun with it. But I understand, you know. I always say this, you know, I like cooking. You know, I cook for people. I love it, but I don't want to be a chef. You know, I understand what the good food is, and I understand the importance of it, but I don't want to be a chef. So that's my view. What's yours? Wow, that is um. <laughs> that is a loaded question. Um, wow. Well, uh, cause I have like so much to say about it and this is not the first time that people have asked me, uh, about it, but essentially when I was an undergrad, you're right. I was, um, for those of you who don't know, I was, I had the same super supervisor as Feely and, um, uh, I did all computational physics and I really liked it. I guess that that's like my cooking for you, Feely, if you will, like, I really, really liked computational physics, and I thought that it really gave me a great tool. However, the university that we went to, CineFX, like, I mean, Patrick, maybe you can comment on this as well, but like, you know, we don't, the experimentalists in the department, like as in the profs, don't have a main lab there. They don't do their, their hands-on experimental work there. So if ever you want to go into experimental physics as an undergraduate research student at CineFX, if you're lucky, they send you maybe for like a few weeks or something like that to a lab elsewhere. But most of the time, you're probably just getting data um, from a lab elsewhere and just analyzing that data. So I wasn't really exposed to that type of experimental work at CineFX. Um, which led me to not do experimental research. And I kind of also really liked Peter Poole. Like he was a great supervisor and, you know, 
like I said, computational physics just helped me in any domain in research. Um, but I did really like the labs at CNFX. I thought it was a lot of fun. I was also really good at them. I liked the fact, and I've always liked the fact that I can be hands-on with something and see what happens there. Even if it's like a small progress to my research or a small progress to my experiment or whatever it is, I can like, I can feel what I'm doing and I'm doing something right there. And I like, I like that aspect, which is something that I couldn't really get with just being at my laptop. Um, as a theorist. And then when I, like Felix was saying, I was looking at AFM. I thought it was really cool. I met the group members. I was like, wow, this is the place I want to be there 100%. And being in a lab every day, I love, and I'm a person who needs to be social. I like, I like being around people. I like working with people, I like collaborating with people, you know, teamwork and everything like that. And that's also something that I got during COVID that other people and theorists couldn't get couldn't have you know like while everyone during the fifth or sixth wave were at home you know just doing research like theory and everything like that um and weren't allowed to go to campus i was allowed to go to campus and see people uh, because i was an experimentalist and had to go into the lab so like that's i really like that aspect and you know like i said just hands-on experience and also just being around people constantly and talking to them and everything so that's really what made me switch into it and i guess kind of made me always a little bit an experimentalist wow yeah it's actually i love i love the way you're here because this is like you know a different so different from a stereotypical physicist image you know you see is this closeted people just like stay in their rooms and like in their basement in their little you know pens and paper and you know don't want to be with themselves which which are a lot of them are like I I love being alone right like, like I need to be alone sometimes especially when I think when I go into deep thought I I'm sure Liam is the same way that that we do but you know we also have physicists like you who love social life love to be in the lab love collaborating it's good to see this you know uh, this stark difference yeah and I mean don't get me wrong I I love my alone times especially when I'm having a rough week I do not want anything more than just going home after work and watching shows and not talking to anyone. But it's the work hours that like that time I really like being with people. And I like the whole collaboration. Like in the lab, we're probably constantly four or five, six people all doing our own thing. But just it's nice to like interact with those people. And um, and yeah. Yeah, that's what I miss the mo most about our undergrad is that we all shared the same office. And I miss that a lot, actually, because like I don't have my own office. I have a shared office with two other people, but we're rare. We're very rarely ever there at the same time. And I see all these other people with the shared offices, and I'm kind of jealous. Like it's nice to have your own space, but I don't know. I I like bouncing ideas off of people. I find things get done a lot better that way. Oh, just to I guess comment on experimental experiences. Um, I did experimental physics as well, and I'm still doing. I guess experiments, but uh, uh, with earth and atmospheric sciences, uh, and it was very interesting during the pandemic because, like, I was locked out of the lab for eight months, and so was almost everyone else, unless they had a super high priority uh, experiment running, where it was like, okay, we're using helium three, which is very expensive and very hard to uh, to get back. Um, but I, I would almost say that there, there. The social aspect was very nice, but then there is the part with experimentalism, uh, especially in particle physics, where you almost collaborate too much and that eats into your productivity time. Uh, so, for example, during my master's, I was in eight to 10 meetings a week because we had collaborators all over the world. And so we would have to meet and catch up with each other within our group at the university, within a broader group at the university and within our international research group. Um, so it was very i guess draining at times the social aspect of it because you're trying to share ideas but it's almost oversharing uh and having too much uh feedback whereas in, in the case of my current lab we all work in the same uh lab space uh or, or in the same cubicle lab space and we are able to bounce ideas off of each other but more casually than having eight to ten formal meetings I will also say we were very fortunate where we were for our undergrad. It was a very social environment. Uh, and so I think that's benefited us after talking to people in many different uh, scientific fields. It seems like 
collaboration wasn't always encouraged in the way that we collaborated with each other. But I mean, that's crazy. Eight to ten meetings a week? Particle physicists, like, they have so many meetings. I don't know why it is, but that's like, I don't know. It's super common. Yeah, I, I'm definitely grateful not, not to have that um, as an experimentalist. And thank God that like most of my work is done with the people around me. And like my only collaborators for now are like people at Université de Montréal. So literally a 20 minute drive if I need to or something like that. Um, but just to comment quickly on you were saying like, yeah, we had such a unique undergrad experience, uh, which I'm really, really thankful for. Um but that's also something that I, because I loved it and because it was such a main part of as to why I loved St. FX, um, I was actually kind of looking for that in my graduate years, if you will. And um, I found that actually at McGill. McGill is awesome in terms of social aspect, um, which wasn't actually pre-pandemic. And I feel like because of the pandemic, because of like people being all like, closed off and not seeing anyone. Um, there was just a wave of grad, grad students in physics specifically that were like, let's, let's do something. And, and, and then it, it, it turned into every Friday after work, we'd go to the park and like, you know, play games and like have a couple of drinks or yeah. And then just like, just enjoying their time there turned into having intramural sports, um, composed of only physics students, uh, trivia nights every week, um, just all these sorts of events, uh, which was really, really cool. And I kind of like found a little bit of what I had at St. FX um, at McGill, which I love. And I think it's so important. Oh, I mean, obviously everyone's different, but at least for me, it's so important for me to have that balance between working hard and like really like, you know, going into your research and just completely shutting off everything that's going on around you to focus on the research. But also I love having those social breaks where like, oh, you know what? Like after work today, I really want to go to trivia with my friends, my physics friends, and just like blow off some steam there. Um, or, you know, go play hockey with some physics people or stuff like that. Like, I just love that whole balance aspect that I found at, at McGill, which is really cool. Well, I think one thing that's kind of, a little bit missing at X when in your year, especially because you have a smaller year that that's like you, it's hard to find physics people to basically like hang out with all the time. Like my year, at least, you know, we, we have a few people, but most of my friends are not physicists. Like, you know, like in, in undergraduate, they're all from various programs and, you know, physicists has a certain quirkiness that's associated with it. You know, especially when I meet in graduate school, it's like, oh, wow. I mean, there's a people who, who, know what a, a lot of what of what I'm talking about I know what they're talking about I'm in, like they're talking about interesting things they work on and I think that's one one part is kind of missing um in terms of almost like in terms of like a diversity of ideas that that you get in graduate school that people are doing like they're want to be expert in the specific field and they're super cool because like it's it's you know they kind of want to devote their life into that right and so some someone that have that much commitment you know there's always interesting story and you know i'm not saying there's not good thing about having a different you know friend group with different fields but i think it's super valuable that we had all these like it makes us to me in my opinion like more rounded as a person you see all these uh, chemists biologists artists um you know social workers or people who work in different fields like well you know, physics is not a know-all and all of things, right? I mean, just to say, as someone who no longer studies physics, I, I, I get that a lot. It, and, and it was nice to get experience with different people and different research. Like, I didn't do physics research my, for some of my undergrad. I did biology and chemistry. And so getting that well-rounded approach kind of kept me interested in other areas. And now I study forests from space. So that's... Uh, very different than particle physics, but it, it's very good to be social and in that kind of environment where we're able to experience other ideas and even uh, using some of those ideas uh, and pulling them into what you're researching. So, for example, I um, was trying to make electrodes for uh, a, a certain part of an experiment I did during my master's, and I pulled a lot of the knowledge that I did from looking at sea slug brains. So, there was a lot of overlap uh and even transferring into this 
uh, new program, there, there was still a lot of overlap between um, analysis and data analysis because it's all just big data nowadays. Yeah, I was very kind of, I was on rails. I was very kind of like, I have one goal in mind and I'm going for it. Um, but yeah, I actually regret that. I think getting that broad kind of knowledge from different fields is the way to go. It helps so much. Like bouncing ideas off of people who aren't physicists is like one of my favorite things to do. Um, I know you guys have some comments, but for the sake of time, um, Feely has not asked his favorite question yet, so I'm going to ask you, Kat. Um, he always asks our guests, well, I, I'll get him to ask it because he were, he can ask it better than I can about your hopes and dreams. And that's actually what I was about to ask. Like, you know, is this like a, the tougher questions I almost. So, Kat, what's your, your hopes and dreams? What do you, you know, why do you see yourself? You know, you're doing an AFM and stuff, you know, but, but really, but really, like, you know. What what do you see yourself in terms of not just as physicists, you know, as a scientist, basically, right? Like moving forward, do you want to be an AFM expert or what type of things you do? Because I in grad school things change, people change in fields to postdocs to do completely different things. You know, you don't have to think about it much right now, but I think it's just good exercise. You know, maybe maybe you already have a some kind of dream that you want to be. Like who do you see yourself be you know let, okay, let's put it like this. Let's look at your potential self, you know, who, who, who would you like to be? Um, that's a really good question. And uh, that is something that I actually ask myself pretty much all the time. And I always keep that in mind, whatever I do, because it's so important, in my opinion, to know what your like general goals are. But I'm, and you're entirely right, really not in, in the sense of like, hmm. 10 years from now, I want to have this position at this job and I want to ma be making X amount of money or I want to be at this university being a prof professor. I mean, like just generally what you want to work towards and how, like how you want to apply the things that you're learning right now, especially as a grad student, you know, we don't get paid that much. You know, you work tireless hours. Like, why are you doing it? You know, what's the reason you're doing it? And I think that's always important to ask yourself. So to answer your question, um, well, I mean, for those of you who don't know me, I am like accepted my PhD position at McGill. So I'll be starting that in the fall. Um, so clearly that will occupy quite a few years, um, quite, a, uh, quite a bit of time in the next few years. Um, but afterwards I'm not going in, I don't want to go into academia. Uh, I don't want to go do postdoc and go into become a professor or something like that. I don't want to, I'm not interested. I like, I don't want to become obviously by the end of my PhD, I'll become some sort of expert in AFM in a specific field of AFM. Um, but most importantly, what I thought was really cool, and I didn't mention this before, but um, in the experimental work that I do, I'll have so many tools, right? I'll have basically an electrical engineering back pocket of tools, if you will. Um, I'll also, you know, I'll have some avid COVID coding um uh, tools as well because uh because I'm always updating some code so I will have that in my back pocket obviously I'm not like a lot of you here probably but you know I'll have that um you know I'm, I'm, I'll be doing some electrochemistry some bio stuff all these different types of tools that I hope to be using in some sort of um technology industry so um quantum computing quantum computing really interests me um but whatever it is I mean I always I know I want to go into industry. My hope and dream is to some be part of a team and hopefully lead a team in technology um, and be at that like really at the forefront of tech and especially probably like, you know, like I said, quantum computing tech, um, which I think is pretty, pretty cool. Um, and so that's kind of part of my hopes and dreams. The other thing that I really, really want to mention, and I think is probably more important than that in general, what type of scientist I want to be. Well, I don't know. I mean, you guys probably already know this, but like, I've always been part of all these committees and, and taking on these leadership positions and all of that. And one of the main reasons why I do that, well, one is that I really like doing that, but two, you know, there's not a lot of women in physics, you know, we're underrepresented, <laughs> represented. And I actually saw this seminar not this long ago. And I think the stat is 17% of physicists are women. Uh, which is very low and amongst the lowest out there in all fields. 
it's probably, I think, the lowest with like electrical engineering. Um, but I still at McGill, I'm part of multiple committees of like student council committees, et cetera. Um, and what I want to, what I hope by doing this today and what I do at McGill and everything like that, and what I've done in the past is to become that leader in physics and as a scientist, as a woman, and hopefully, um, get more women in physics and inspire more women to go into physics, because I do think that we need to bridge that gender gap. So I guess that answers your question, kind of what I want to be later on. Fair, yeah, I'll, uh, super answer, really. Yeah, yeah, I, I like it, you know, because basically, well, the way I understand it is like, you don't want to follow your passion, right? You want to follow your passion. So your PhD, your master, your graduate school, basically, you're trying to equip yourself with the tools that allow you to do that. Even though, you know, a lot, for a lot of people, you do that in undergrad, right? And that's enough for, so, for a lot of people. But if you want to work in advanced tech, it's almost, it's, it's imperative that you equip yourself with these highly advanced, complicated um, tools and ideas and this thought you discuss with people in your field, you know? And there are industries that only hire like, like PhDs, right? Because is, you, there are technical, uh, technicalities that require that, that comes with doing PhD, like learning how to do research. I think that is, is very good. It's like because the PhD doesn't, does not necessarily mean you're going to be in academia. I think that's what a lot of people have that kind of misconception. That's like, oh, you want to teach? No, no, no. They are actually you learn to be a researcher. You learn how to do research, how to work in complicated advanced ideas. Yeah, and uh, and that's really interesting that you say that because one of the things that I value, I'm just gonna quickly gonna say this, but like one of the things I value about my group is that my um, my supervisor actually like wants us to go into industry, like also wants us to go into academia. But we actually have a lot of I'd say like maybe fifty percent or something of grad uh, grad students that are in the group after their masters or after their PhD, they go into industry and they all go like on all sorts of different things. Some people go into um, software startups. Um, some of them go into the Canadian banknote company, which you have to sign a whole NDA for, which is this whole crazy story too. Um, some people, you know, just, uh, go in academia. Some people go into other different, uh, industry or businesses and stuff like that. So it's really, it's, it's, you have the sort of saying you have all these tools and you become a pretty big expert in with all those tools. And so you're kind of, you know, you can go into all sorts of different fields, which kind of keeps my doors open, which I really like. Yeah, you've you've really equipped yourself well for your future, I think, with like coding, experience, like lab experience, and especially in that industry as well, like the atomic um, force stuff. That's that's huge. Um, so so quick, one last question. Um, so like you said, you know, science or at least physics is unfortunately predominantly old white men, as we know. Um, I mean, that'll be me one day. Apologies, but. What what got you? Why did you decide to pursue physics? What got you into it? Because that that's always an interesting thing to hear about. Everyone seems to have a very different story. So I have a <laughs> my story is very interesting. I'll try to keep it very short because I feel like I've been talking so much during this whole thing. Now we can have a slightly long. I have a very short story today, so it 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 works out. So I yeah I have a very yeah it's kind of a complicated thing so when i was in high school i was okay where can i start this when i was in high school we had this thing called career day okay where people alum from from my high school would come and explain what their career was and everything like that and it was always the same thing it was lawyers business people uh, like ceos or whatever just people like with their own businesses and it was doctors like medical doctors like that was the main thing. And then maybe like some sort of, there was social worker or maybe um, fashion designer or stuff like that. There was no one in engineering or physics ever. And so the, and no, my family is, they're all business people. So I have zero like exposure to, to, to physics except for in class. And in class, I was like weirdly good in physics. Like it was so weird. And he, like the smartest people in my class were like, you know, what is going on? Like, why is Catherine like getting like almost a hundreds and every, every single thing? And I was like, I have, I have no idea. Um, but then fast forward, I went to CJEP. For those of you who don't know, CJEP is just a transition school between high school and university. It's one of those weird things that Quebec does, which I actually really like though. Um, and when I was in CJEP, 
I did IB history because I was like, okay, well, I don't really know what I want to do. I know I don't want to go into business. I don't want to go into med- medicine. I don't want to go um, into, into like law. So I was like, I'm just going to go into something that I'm passionate about, which is history. And then maybe I'll go into academia. But in CJEP, they force you to do, um, in IB CJEP, they force you to do all your math courses. So your Calc 1, Calc 2, um, probability and statistics. I loved Calc 1 and Calc 2. And it was just so satisfying for me. And then I was like, okay, now I need to decide where I need to go for university. And then I was looking at programs and I was like, okay, I guess I'm going to history. It's not a, it's not the most ideal thing in the world, but whatever it is, what it is. And um, then I started thinking, what's one thing that I regretted not doing? And I was thinking a lot and I was like, wow, like I, I had friends who were, who were doing physics courses. I'm like, man, I wish I was doing physics courses right now, which is probably weird to say, but I mean, that's the thought that popped into my head. And then um, I had originally applied for um, for five, at five different universities in the UK in history. Um, and, uh, and then my backup university was McGill and I actually only got waitlisted for one university in the UK and that destroyed me for some reason. I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't get into any universities. I got waitlisted on one. Um, and then McGill was my backup and it got accepted. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to take the fact that I regretted not taking physics. I'm going to ask McGill, McGill, like, can I switch into physics? And they did this whole plan for me. They're like, okay, you need to take these courses, these first year course, courses, because you, you didn't take it in CJEP. And then when I had to make the decision between going to history in London or uh, physics at McGill, I was like, okay, London is really cool, but I'm going to choose physics at McGill. And then I went to McGill detested McGill as an undergrad student. Um, and anyone can confirm with me, like the, everyone feels the same way. Um, and so one day I just looked on my laptop and I was like, what are the best small schools in Canada? And then I, St. FX popped up and they had a great physics program. And ever since I've been in physics at St. FX, it's been the best decision of my life. It's just been like so great and amazing. And I instantly fell in love with it. So that is my very long, but, and very zigzag journey into physics. But I'm glad that I guess like the moral of all of this is that I'm really glad that I've always listened to my instincts and in deciding what I want to do or what I don't want to do and just going for it. Nice. I, I love that story. My favorite thing is how everyone seems to have a very like a completely different story about why they got into physics or science or whatever it's, i mean some people like like me i have a very basic one that i won't get into but it's it's good to hear the interesting ones yeah i think physics especially is like a niche yeah. right like you don't because you don't think of it as like, oh you're not good there to make money you're not going to go there to you know, change well, I mean, you don't change the world in terms of engineering. You go there to change the underst- your own understanding, really. Because it's, it's, to me, physics interests much more internal than external. Even though you can make a lot of uh, impact, impact to the world, but why people st- study physics or mathematics even, right? It's because they're curious. This, to me, is an important part, very important part of the human nature. Yeah, and I feel like, I don't know, I don't know what, you, what yours is, you guys' backstory is as, as to why you went in physics, but I feel like a lot of people, it's like, oh, like when I was 10, I was like looking at the stars and I thought it was so interesting. And then I looked at a telescope and I was like, oh my gosh, what's out there in the universe? And I was like, and I'm like, to be honest, that's never happened. Like, yes, I looked at the stars and I was like, wow, this is really cool. But I never really thought of anything more than that. It's not like I, I like saw the Feynman lectures when I was like 10 and then just like, oh my God, like physics is what I need to be in. It's just like, it's weird because you're right. Like if you're an inherently curious person and you like, obviously you like math and you like all that, like it's so cool once you discover, even if you're 18 years old and you discover it or you're 10 years old and you discover it, you're like, wow, physics is actually really cool. And it, and it, it, it really quenches my thirst for that curiosity. You know what I mean? So I don't have that 10 year old story, but I do have an 18 year old who stumbled upon it and was like, wow, I'm happy I stumbled upon it. Very nice. Very nice. My, yeah, my stories are definitely, I mean, I just would go, I would get angry in like high school classes when I couldn't get things. I'd be like, 
I'd get a physics problem for homework. And I would just like sit there and stare at it and be like, why can't I know, understand this? And then I'd hyper fixate on it. Next thing you know, physics was the only thing I was good at. <laughs> so, Well, uh, just in the interest of time, and uh, so we don't delve too deep into each other's uh, physics backgrounds and why we did it, uh, you can listen to previous episodes uh, for some clues. Uh, are there any final thoughts from you, Catherine? Um, I mean, no, but honestly, I just wanted to say, like I said at the beginning, like, this is awesome that you guys are doing this. And um, it's kind of nice to talk about, take the time to talk about my research to you guys. And I feel like, you know, like, as I think, I think Patrick mentioned this at the start, you know, we've known each other for for quite some time now. And it's just nice to to touch base and to talk about all of this and, and to to talk also about it with everyone who's listening, which is really, really awesome. And I just want to emphasize again, it's really cool what you guys are doing. And I think that it's so important to just talk about it. And I think physics is something that is not talked about it that talked about that often and should be talked about more, especially with the general public. One, um, one, one cool thing about this. So thanks so much for coming on. Um, our old undergrad prof, which you mentioned earlier, one of the Peters, uh, Peter Marslin, he, he told us that he hasn't ever, well, a bunch of us who graduate from our undergraduate St. of X, we still talk all the time and we're in contact. We have this big discord group and he told us he's never seen anything like that before. Usually when you graduate from your undergrad, you just kind of like move on and you, you, you still have like a few friends that you talk to, but he'd never seen so many of us stay in contact. So it's great that we're doing like, I love this kind of stuff so much. But, you know, I just want to mention, I want to make sure that everyone who's listening um, knows this I, Feely, Patrick, and Liam are the people who included me the first day that I arrived at St. FX and who included me. Oh, what? Yeah. I mean, I think it was Patrick mainly first. Um, but I remember in the first week, I like hung out with you guys. And I just, I'm not joking. I'm not like, like uh, exaggerating or anything like that. It's honestly because of you guys that made my experience at St. FX so much better. And to emphasize also on what Peter Marsland said about how it's really cool that, you know, we, we kept in touch and are still hanging out, even if it's virtually, um, you know, you guys are what created this whole dynamic between all the different years at St. FX, all the different, you know, people in different years at St. FX. And, um, I think you guys should be really happy and proud about it. And I'm really thankful for it as well, because without you guys, um, my experience at St. FX would probably have been different. And I'm just really happy that all of you were so um, inclusive and um, yeah, wanted yeah. to hang out with me and wanted me to be part of your group, even though I was two years younger. So thank you for that. All right. Yeah, that that's great. You know, I have some little bit of final remarks too from from your your origin story. It sounds like you're, you're like a physics late bloomer, right? right? So that's uh, that is really cool. You don't see it that much because you know there are the mathematical requirements that people had to go through in the earlier years of life. But when, I mean, you're pretty exceptional. Pick it up at eighteen, you know. <laughs> so that's good. And you know, coming coming here, being together, I think is is such an important thing too. It's so, it's so quick. But yeah, me and Feely and Patrick are always like our whole physics careers we're always like nagging everyone we're like come on and hang out with us yeah let's like have an event and get together like like the group stuff that like all the social activities like we love that stuff and i think i mean a lot of it's feely i like me and patrick are there but feely's like the driving force i think for that so god bless feely what a legend well it, it, it's certainly great um that we we still talk to each other and expect uh some future people from St. of X who we went uh, to school with to be on this podcast. But thank you very much, Catherine, for taking the time to be here. Um, if you are interested in being on this podcast and you didn't go to school with us for whatever reason, uh, you, there are many different ways in which you can contact us. You can send us an email. Uh, our email account is hyperthesispodcast at gmail.com. So you can ask questions. Uh, you can leave some comments, or you can leave some ideas for future con uh, topics to discuss. Uh, if you'd like to be a guest and share with your experience uh, in your own research field, we would be more than happy to have you, whether you study physics or biology or chemistry or whatever it may be. We're interested in all types of sciences. You can also find us on Instagram. We are at The Hyperthesis, where we will post updates, memes, and some behind-the-scenes looks uh, for different episodes. 
uh, so you'll be always updated when we post an episode. If you want to watch our videos or listen on YouTube, we also have a YouTube channel. You can just search for Hyperthesis Podcast and we should pop up. We have, uh, I think, all of season one and a bit of season two on there right now, and we're working on processing more episodes. Uh, If you want to listen to us, which I assume you're doing now, uh, otherwise, how are you hearing this? You can find us on pretty much any podcasting service. We are on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify. We are based out of Anchor.fm, so you can find us pretty much everywhere. And uh, Catherine, is there a way you would want people to contact you if they have questions about your research or your experience? Yeah, well, I mean, I have an Instagram account uh dedicated to my physics adventures and sometimes i'm more active than other times but it's basically a way for me to blow blow off some steam from my graduate student duties and work um and it's at life of a underscore physicist um so if ever you want to give that a follow by all means you can be entertained by my weird stories and my content about what i'm doing in the lab and everything like that so by all means give me a follow Okay, well, uh, if, if you want to contact any, any of us, those are the ways. Um, and thank you again, Catherine, for joining us. And we will end this episode uh, with a very quick, as we were promised, story from Liam. Yeah, so it's not so much a story. It's more so I'm just going to summarize the 1986 Nobel Prize in Physics. I pretty much just went on their website, took the page where they summarized it, and kind of wrote it in my own words. Um, well, as best as possible. So go go check out their website for the, the more information. Um, so 1986 Nobel Prize in Physics was for the invention of both the scanning tunneling microscope and the atomic force. Well, scanning tunneling microscope and the electron microscope. Um, like I I mentioned this earlier. Um, so on the 15th of October 1986, the Royal Swedish Academy decided to award the Nobel Prize in Physics. Um by one half to Professor Ernst uh, Ruska. I might be pronouncing that slightly wrong. I apologize. And they gave it to him for his fundamental work in electron optics and for his design of the first electron microscope. Um, and the other half of the award was awarded jointly. So it was a, the second half of the award was awarded to two people, um, to Dr. Uh, Gerd Binning. I might be pronouncing that last name wrong. And Dr. Henrik uh, Rohrer for their design of the scanning tunneling microscope. Um, so the electron microscope is this, uh, you, you've probably heard of this if you're in science, at least. It's a very common, very useful thing. Um, it's this extremely important tool in almost every field of science. And by 18 or 1986, it was, this, it was really fully established. Um, it was one of the most important inventions of the century. Uh, its development um, began with the, the work of uh, Ruska, who was a young student at the Berlin Technical University um, in the end of the 1920s. That he found that you can actually use a magnetic coil and it can act as a lens, but for electrons. Um, and that you could use these electron lenses to obtain an image of an object that you irradiate with the electrons. So it's, it's, it's kind of similar to a microscope, but instead of with light, it's with electrons. Um, and he also found that by coupling two electron lenses together, you could get kind of this primitive, well, you get a primitive microscope, but now with electrons. And Kat mentioned this earlier, but you can't resolve things you can't resolve very small things with light light has a much larger wavelength than atoms say um however the l- wavelength of an electron can be up to a hundred thousand times shorter than visible light so electron microscopes have a much higher resolving power than light microscopes and you can use them to reveal the structure of very small objects so that's why this kind of invention was so um important and it was built upon and improved in a bunch of ways but he was the first kind of this Ruska guy was the first one to come up with this. Yeah, so so electron microscopy was it's, it's been developed a lot through the years, um, and it led to the kind of new design called the scanning tunneling electron microscope. Um, and a number of researchers took part in this development from the electron microscope to the scanning tunneling microscope. Um, but it was Ruska's pioneering work that led the way. So for the second half of the Nobel Prize between Gerd and uh, Heinrich or Henrik. Um, this was this is for the scanning tunneling microscope, and it, it's not a true microscope like we talked about earlier. You're not actually it's unlike the electron microscope or like an optical microscope. You're not actually looking at light or electrons kind of bouncing off something. 
it's kind of like this like what Kat said it's this blind man's approach you you probe something you gain information from that i won't get into that because we talked about it a bit already but even in 1986 this the scanning tunneling microscope was still fairly new um it was completely new actually and people had only kind of seen the beginning of what it could do in its development but it was so clear that it was going to open up entirely new fields of study that it was partially awarded the Nobel Prize, which is kind of rare. Usually when you have Nobel Prizes in physics, you perform research and then, you know, 50 years later, you win it. Like Ruska, he, in like the late 1920s, he came out with the electron microscope and 50 years later, 56 years later, he got the Nobel Prize. Um, so yeah, that's kind of just the summary of what the 1986 Nobel Prize was for the electron microscope and the scanning tunneling microscope, which are related to these atomic force microscopes. Very, very interesting. And uh, now you know more about the 1986 Nobel Prize and the advent of the fairly recent advent of these very intense and useful technologies. Depends who you ask. They could be old. They could be new. Opinion based. True. Uh, don't ask a computer scientist. They might say it's quite new or quite old. Um, but either way, uh, these uh, are very useful devices, and our conversation about uh, atomic force microscopy and looking into Catherine's life and work has been very eye-opening, and we hope you enjoyed it. So thank you very much for joining us, Catherine. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Bye, everyone. See ya. See ya.